Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Introduction to Compressed Air webinar. My name is Beth, and I'll be hosting today's webinar, which means I'll be monitoring the chat window and conducting some survey polling at the end of the webinar. Today we'll be covering some highlights from our half-day seminar, Compressed Air Systems, which is November the 15th in Wilsonville. Our hope is that after today you'll be able to understand some of the fundamentals of compressed air and be able to apply them at your facility to help you save energy and money. We also want to thank our sponsors today, the Energy Trust of Oregon and the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Based on our customer feedback, we know that they appreciate that we're aligned with these two organizations to help eliminate any confusion regarding energy efficiency and renewables. Before I introduce the presenter today, I'd like to show you some tools you'll be using during the webinar. To the right of your screen, you'll see the chat window, and the polling window will appear below that at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions today during the webinar, you can submit them to me, the host, through chat, and the instructor will answer them at the end of the webinar. At the top of your screen, underneath the Quick Start tab, you'll see some tools, which I've just drawn a red line under. The instructor will uh, be asking you to use these tools on specific slides during the webinar. So um, just uh, wait on that and you'll get a chance to use those. Our presenter this morning is Eric Bessie. Eric is a licensed professional mechanical engineer and compressed air systems specialist with over 17 years of experience. He has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Oregon State University. He has performed over 100 compressed air audits and has extensive knowledge of low and medium voltage reciprocating uh, rotary screw and centrifugal compressor types. He is responsible for the development of AirMaster, a nationally recognized software program used to model existing and improved compressed air systems. He is a U he is certified USDOE AirMasters Plus specialist and instructor and is a USDOE Save Energy Now expert. And now I would like to hand the presentation over to Eric. Hi, thanks, Beth. Um, first of all, I, I can't claim total responsibility for the development of AirMaster. I was very fortunate to be offered a graduate program at Oregon State University, go Beavers, and uh, so I really owe a lot to, uh, to them. And you might wonder why I got into compressed air, and, and I didn't really know what it was, but I'm kind of a mechanical guy, and I, I have a lot of, plenty of grease under my fingernails, and so when I saw the opportunity, I grabbed it, and it turned out to be a very, very reward, rewarding, indeed, uh, profession that I'm in. So today I'd like to talk about, first of all, you know, why, why do we care about compressed air? Well, I, you know, 20 years ago I certainly didn't even know what it was beyond uh, pumping up my tire. And, uh, you know, when I was 16, got my driver's license and pumped up the tire. I had no idea that they were, uh, the compressed air was used um, so prolifically in, uh, in industry. And it virtually is used in every aspect of industry. So the three main topics I'd like to talk about today, and... Um, one of them is what type of controls that we have in compressed air. And uh, really, you might wonder what that is. And we're going to talk about that, what, what uh, controls we have. Also, air pressure and the importance of air pressure and how it can affect our energy bill. And then also leaks. And you can imagine that any leaks in your system is air that you have to re replenish. You have to put it back. Not only leaks, but how we use air in the production, actual uh, productive ways of using compressed air. So first off, just to get a little handle of who you are, I'd like you to select this little arrow up here in the top, and I'm going to start you off. Well, Michael here has already started us off. Put your arrow of your name next to who you are, whether you're a manager, an end user, uh, equipment supplier. Um, this kind of can help see where you are. A lot of times, um, people, uh, facility managers and maintenance, or, you know, facility managers rather, they're, they're aware of compressed air, but, but uh, that they use it, but perhaps they're not right down on the floor where it's being used. And so that can kind of help. We like to bring as many people as we can down to the floor where it's used, because that's where the expense of compressed air is incurred when it is used. Okay, so I see we have some energy managers, a couple of energy managers, consultants. Um, do we have any end users out there who are actually on the floor using compressed air? Uh, you might be a factory worker or uh, you might even be a, a, a maintenance, an operator of compressed air. Okay. All right. So we have a variety of people here. Uh, okay. Let's move on. Um, 
there are some kind of myths about compressed air that are out there, and these sort of just develop over time based on information that you've gathered or, or your kind of your, your paradigm about compressed air. And one of the biggest ones is that compressed air is free. And I think we'll learn today that absolutely, without a doubt, compressed air is not free. It's actually quite expensive, and we'll take a look at that. Um, another possible myth is that more pressure is better. Well, more pressure not only can raise your energy bill, but can actually do harm to the equipment. What pressure does your system operate at? Well, kind of the nominal value, sort of the average that people kind of throw out there is, oh, our, our, our uh, system operates at 100 PSI, when they really don't know what it operates at, and more importantly, what they even need. A lot of times I'll find plants that are operating at a higher pressure than necessary. As you can imagine, higher pressure will increase your energy bill. You can just imagine you know, when you're a kid and you're pumping up your bicycle tire, and it gets harder and harder to pump as the pressure in the tire actually wants to come back out uh, the higher you, you uh, the pressure that you uh, compress to. Okay, why compare about, uh, care about compressed air? Well, if we look at the life cycle of an air compressor or a system, a compressed air system over 10 years, I can see that approximately 12% of that 10-year cost goes to the purchase of the equipment. And this goes to the selection, what type of compressor are you going to purchase, what kind of options, energy savings options, um, whatever it might be, dryers, et cetera, goes to 12%. Maintenance, maybe another 12%. Okay. Look at this. This is the most important piece of the pie to look at. 76% of the compressed air expenditures go to electricity. So if you think about it, you know, whether you're going to nickel and dime your equipment might make a big impact in the electricity use. So keep that in mind when you purchase equipment. It might be worth it to purchase that energy efficiency option. Check this out. Over the cost, the cost over a year operating a 100-horsepower compressor is about $30,000, and that assume, assumes 6,000 operating hours at seven cents a kilowatt hour. And that's about what you're paying right now. In 6,000 hours, that's, that's your Monday through Friday, uh, 24, you know, around the clock shift. So that's pretty normal. And it so happens that that $30,000 to operate that compressor is just a little under the cost of purchasing a new 100 horsepower compressor. Maybe not a variable speed compressor, but your regular fixed speed rotary screw compressor might cost about that much. So boom, out of the gate, one year and you've paid for it, or you've doubled the cost, I should say, you've spent that much. Okay, I like this slide. Let's suppose that you have a weight that you have to lift, and maybe you have a pulley around a motor, and then you have a weight, okay? And you have two options to lift that weight. You can either do it with an electric motor, or you can do it with a one horsepower air motor. Both have one horsepower at the shaft, so they both do the same thing, but one's direct drive electric and one actually uses compressed air to operate. Let's take a look at the costs between the two. I actually find this quite staggering. $200 per year, straight electric, to $1,500 a year to compress air. If you think about it, in the compressed air motor, there's actually a middleman called the air compressor. So you take a direct drive motor to compress the air by operating an actual air compressor. Then you take the air to operate the motor. So you can see there's a huge efficiency loss between the two. We'll talk about that. Okay. Controls. What kind of controls do you have? So guess what? Let's see. I'm going to go up here, and I'd like you to also... Click on the upper left arrow to select your, uh, to put it into uh, in terms of your your name, and select what kind of uh, let's see what do I want to be today. Oh, I don't know what I want to be, so I'll choose I don't know. So put your name, select what kind of controls, and if you don't know what kind of controls you have, that's absolutely fine. We're going to go over each one of these, uh, and we're going to be brief about it. If you go to the November 15th course in Wilsonville. We'll have a whole half day to talk about all kinds of things, so I would encourage you to go. Really, one of the points of this, this webinar here is to get you kind of, you know, inspired and jacked up so that hopefully I see you 
on the 15th to learn more. Okay, variable frequency drive. A couple I don't know is perfectly fine. I'm going to show you a, little, a couple of ways, a little bit of how you can tell what you have. Okay. Part load controls for compressors. Just like I promised, we're going to go over each one of these. Start, stop. What's that? Well, start, stop is just like a light switch. It's on or it's off. Kind of like the service station gas uh, air, air compressor at the gas station to pump up your tire. Or maybe that pancake compressor you have in your, your uh, shop to uh, maybe drive a nail gun. Those basically start at a low pressure and then have a pressure switch that shuts it off. Okay, very, very efficient but not really practical for large machines. If you start and, start, start and stop large motors many times, you can burn them up, damaging on electrical starting gear. So really, for larger compressors, probably what you have are one of these other four. One of the most common, to even today, very, very common, is modulation. Now, modulation literally means to regulate or modulate the flow through the machine. And it does so by restricting the air inlet to the compressor. So you can imagine, like your car, maybe some of you did this when you were a kid, I don't know. You take the air cleaner off, you shove a sock down it, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to reduce the airflow through the engine, and it might even die. And that's what it does with the air compressors. That's what we do with the air compressor. We restrict the air inlet. Very, very effective, not very efficient. Okay, another way is load-unload. Load unload uh, operates by pressure dropping to a set point. The compressor loads up, pressurizes the oil sump, and pushes the air out to discharge. Once it pumps up to a higher pressure, it unloads. And by unloading, it dumps the oil, uh, air in the oil sump and then sort of relaxes. It's kind of like in your car, you're driving up to the stop sign, you put your car in neutral, and you're stopped, and your car is idling. It's still using fuel, but very, very little, and it's not doing any work because you're stopped. Variable displacement. This is somewhat rare. Um, you'll see them on rotary screws and reciprocating compressors. I sort of like the analogy of if you have a four-cylinder engine in your car, and you unplug one of the spark plugs, you now have a three-cylinder. You've taken away 25% of that engine's displacement. So that's kind of like uh, how uh, reciprocated compressors in particular operate. We can reduce the displacement. Lastly, you know, the hero of the day, everybody's talking about variable frequency drives. Uh, in more general terms, I can say variable speed drive because there are variants of motors that don't use variable frequency but actually are DC motors that might reduce the voltage to the DC motor. Both are ways of slowing down, varying the speed of the motor. These compressors are very well suited for trim duty. What is trim duty? Well, we'll talk about that, too, when we come up. Air inlet modulation. Okay. So as you can see from the bottom, we have air coming in. Okay. Air is going through the inlet and it makes it past this butterfly valve, which in this illustration is fully open. So the compressor is at full load. It's, it's huffing and puffing, doing all it can do. And then as my system pressure rises, eventually I have to do something. Otherwise, we're going to blow up the system. So we start restricting the air inlet by closing the butterfly valve. Now, your compressor might not have an actual butterfly valve. It might have what's called a piston valve or a slide valve. It's the same thing. It just restricts the amount of air that can go through the inlet. Okay, so let's take a look at an actual compressor. Okay, here I have an air inlet. Let's see here. An air inlet. Air is coming in through the boot, up, you know, through the top, coming in. And it goes through the air horn. Okay, we can call this kind of the, I call it an air horn. And then in here, there's a butterfly valve that can rotate, just like it did in my previous picture. There's linkage. There's an arm uh, that can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. At the end of that arm, 
here's a, another mechanical arm, a linkage. And this linkage joins this butterfly valve actuator to, in this case, an actual pneumatic operated actuator. What this is here, over here, is system pressure feeding into a diaphragm. And as this diaphragm becomes pressurized, it pushes an arm, which all ties together and makes this work. So it's kind of like the linkage on your, if I can dare say, a carburetor. We don't know what those are anymore. Some of you might. Okay, so it's just a straight mechanical linkage. And then as pressure is relieved from the system, the spring pulls it back to reload the compressor. So it sit, just sits there and operates within a, a narrow pressure band. Okay, that's how that works. Very simple. Inlet throttle modulation example. Now here's a performance curve, okay? As that throttle restricts, I actually slide down this curve. So I go this way as I need less air. Yes, I'm an artist too. All right, not so much. All right, so you can see here that 100% flow requirement I need 100% power. That makes sense. That's full load. As I throttle back, 50% flow requirement, you can see that I still require a little over 80%. Here's the sh shocker. When the compressor isn't doing anything at all, well, it's actually doing something, but it's not doing anything to the plant. Uh, no air is flowing out of the plant. If my requirement goes to zero for this compressor, let's say I have other compressors that are meeting the need, but I've got this guy running and I don't need them, and he throttles all the way back. 68%. This value can be anywhere between 60 to 70%, depending on your compressor. But that's how much energy that it requires just sitting there all the way throttled. So you just stuck a sock down it. No air is getting through. The main reason why it uses so much energy at no flow is that the oil sump is still fully pressurized. So the compressor is still working against that high pressure, yet none of it is getting out of the, of the check valve out the discharge. Let's look at some other control types. Now, here's the best. This is the best you can do. Start, stop. I either operate fully loaded, it rises, reaches a set point, and then shuts off. Remember, this is like your gas station compressor or your, your uh, little compressor in your house you might have for projects. It just you know, bangs back and forth, start, stop, start, stop, against a pressure range. That's the most efficient. Let's take a look at some in-betweeners. Here's an, what we call an ideal load unload, where it operates fully loaded, or it blows down the sump and just operates down here. You know, you're at the stoplight, your clutch is in, the car is just idling. Hopefully your clutch isn't in. Hopefully you're wise enough to put it in neutral and relax to save that throw out bearing. That's another subject another day. But that's what it does. It just basically operates in between full load and no load. Now, in reality, because the sump blows down, and that sump blows down, we don't quite achieve this ideal load unload. Depending on how much storage you have, in reality, you might have something more like this, where depending on what the average requirement is, you'll have various power requirements depending on the storage. This happens to be for two gallons per CFM of delivery. Now, you can certainly increase the storage, and that'll better this curve. Uh, that's a subject for November 15th. But just uh, keep in mind that the more storage you have for oil-flooded load-unload compressors, the better average performance. And I know you're all wondering why, and I wonder why, too. I hope I figure it out by November 15th. But we can talk about it on November 15th. Okay, next. This is kind of a hybrid. I like this slide. It shows a combination of upper-range modulation and if I throttle back to a certain point and reach a pressure, I can blow down. And so I can sort of obtain an average curve like this. Notice that the no load is still down here, fully unloaded, just hanging out. I'm in neutral at the stop sign, just burning very, very little, maybe. This, and this number, by the way, can vary between 15% to 30%, depending on the manufacturer. Some compressors maintain a sump pressure, and that can keep the power a little higher. All right, now we've got a lot of stuff on here. I wonder what's next. I bet you can guess. That's right, variable speed drive. 
variable frequency drive, variable speed drive, whatever you want to call it. Look at this curve. This curve is very close to the average performance of a start-stop. Not quite, but it's very, very, very close. Very nice. Up here at about the half percent mark, 50%, I mean, uh, on up to full load, we have a pretty nice curve. Does anything notice any difference up here, however? What about this point up here? That's right. If I operate my variable speed compressor at full load, chances are my power is actually going to be higher than it would be for other control types. And just as the air compressor was the middleman between lifting that weight that we talked about and the motor and the, uh, the winch itself, the motor, uh, the middleman for variable frequency drive or variable speed drive is the drive itself. So that voltage, that 4D voltage that comes in, we have to do something with it. We have to vary the frequency or the DC voltage to vary the speed of that motor. And that drive in kind of a, oh, I won't say it. I was going to say an engineering word. I won't. It's just a heater, okay? It uses, it uses energy and makes heat. So it's, it's a source of inefficiency. And then, but you know, I, I might ask you, why would you buy a variable speed drive and operate it at full load? I mean, what was the point? You spend an extra $10,000 or $20,000 for that drive, and you're not even using it if you're operating at full load. So you might even go a little farther to say, well, if I have five compressors, why would I want all of them to be variable speed? I really only need one trim compressor and operate others at full load or off. So it's something to think about. And believe me, I've seen plants that have a lot of variable speed compressors, and they've shelled out that money uh, really to do no good, uh, no benefit. And in fact, at full load, maybe they're even hurting themselves. So there we go. Fun stuff. Next. Okay. Ah, improved compressor. What does it say? Improved compressor control. Oh, yeah. What can I do? Okay, good. Um, now, let's see here. In every system, wait a minute. Highlighter, focus. In every system, at least one compressor will operate at part load. If you had the perfect match between air demand and air supply, no, not the early 80s band, but if you had it perfectly matched, you could buy the right size compressor, run it fully loaded, and there you'd go. But every plant, I have yet to see a plant that doesn't vary their production load, vary their air demand. You might have a leak that's not here today, but here tomorrow. So you have to have at least one compressor that can vary its output to meet the needs of the plant. Now, you might have inlet modulation. While it's very, very good, simple, uh, very good at maintaining pressure and very, very simple, it, it's really quite inefficient. I hope that you remember that from that graph I showed. More on that on November 15th. I sound like a politician. Consider load unload or a variable frequency drive for the trim compressor instead. Okay? And if you have load unload, you must have adequate storage. More on that November 15th. But we saw that arched curve on that performance profile. And um, we really have to make sure that we have enough storage. Uh, basically, if you don't have enough storage, your compressor will short cycle. It'll load unload, load unload, load unload. Very, very inefficient and bad on the compressor and can lead to oil carryover and other nasty things. So while steel is expensive, you must have adequate storage to efficiently operate and effectively operate load unload. Controls. All right. Okay. Come on time. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. It's always a first. Okay, what's the opportunity here? Let's suppose that I have a 100 horsepower compressor, and that uh, the flow of that compressed uh, the flow, rather, can vary throughout the day between oh I don't know. Let's say that it just varies through the day. We have lunch, we have full production, and it kind of varies between somewhere, you know, maybe 75 CFM all the way up to 450. So it's just inlet throttling all the way. But the average. The average is 250. Okay, now that's inlet modulation. What if we uh, replace that bad boy with a variable speed drive, variable, variable frequency drive compressor? Same flow. Okay, my flow hasn't changed. Just because I put a different compressor in doesn't mean that my production has changed or my leaks. But look at this. We're all the way down at 41 kilowatts. And I've saved an average of 31 kilowatts by 
replacing that with a frequency drive, 13,000 bucks. So right there is my savings, as you can see. So I think this is a nice example. Now this is a simple example. It doesn't always apply to every situation, but it's certainly a, um, a reasonable example. Okay, that's enough about controls. Let's move on to pressure. Yes, you've guessed it. Pick your arrow. And uh, what are you running at? Okay. I'm kind of high flying today. My pressure changes. Okay. We've got uh, Lauren here. I don't know. That's a perfect answer. I love that answer. I love that answer more than anything. You know why? Because it gives me, an energy consultant, probably a good opportunity to come into your plant and maybe find ways to save energy. Okay. When we get these know-it-alls that have already attended my class or maybe they, uh, they're just smart and they've attended classes and they know that they picked this less than 90, and then I go, well, maybe I can find some other ways for you to save energy, but maybe pressure is not one of them. Not to say that it isn't. Okay. So we have, uh, you know, differences of uh, pressure. I'll assume everybody else is in between. And so what about pressure? What the heck? What the heck's all that about? Well, here's a nice rule of thumb. And by nice, I don't mean I just made it up or that it isn't, you know, or it's convenient. But it actually is true that on average, your general system will save about a half a percent horsepower for every PSI reduction. Okay, just like the bicycle tower, or you can think of climbing up a mountain. I don't have to climb to the top of Mount Hood only to walk down to Meadows to ski. Okay, just go to Meadows. Don't go all the way to the top to come back down. Certainly a lot more work. Right? Okay, my math is right. Pretty simple math there. Now that might vary between point, you know, let me maybe... 4% to 5.5%, but on average about 5%. That's that's a good number. I have plenty of data to support that uh, after it was told to me. $30,000, now I can save 1500 So I've taken my $30,000 100 horsepower compressor and I've dropped it down to 28.5. Okay? It took me 10 minutes to go out there and adjust the, the, the pressure set points. So I've paid for my salary. My boss is going to give me a bonus and uh, life as well. What's this? Artificial demand. Artificial demand is the demand imposed on the system simply as a result of operating the system pressure higher than what I need. It's just like the tire in your car. And I don't recommend you do this to your car. Maybe someone you dislike. Maybe your opponent in the upcoming political uh, elections. You go up to their car. You push in the valve, and it hisses like crazy at first. And as the air deplenishes, depletes from the air, uh, the tire, uh, that hissing gets less and less. So basically, you can think of compressed air plant systems as as uh, as tires. And the lower the pressure, the less they leak. Not only that, but cylinders and other end uses. Cylinders, the higher the pressure, the more air I can shove into them. Well, that air had to come from my air compressor, so it, that's demand. So keep that in mind. Leaks leak less as pressure decreases. Okay. What are sources of pressure drop? And I want to say here that pressure drop is significant because if I have a big pressure drop, like a big clog in my line or a big filter that's plugged up, and my end use needs a certain pressure, well, I have to make up for it by operating my – make up for the pressure drop by operating my compressor at a higher pressure – and we already showed that operating compressor at a higher pressure costs about a half a percent per PSI. So here's some sources of, of uh, pressure drops. I'm not going to highlight them. I'm just going to kind of talk about them as you see them. Lots of filters that are in line. You know, if one filter is good, three are better. Well, that's increased pressure drop. I might have very poor, uh, you know, what I call cheap, um, quick disconnects. There's what's called the dirty 30, and the dirty 30 is the last 30 feet leading up to a production line or some piece of equipment that uses compressed air. 
And in between, in that dirty 30 are filters and regulators and maybe lubricators, or maybe I've just connected to the main line with rubber hose, and rubber hoses are small, and there's big restrictions in those. And uh, so there's all kinds of opportunities here. Oh, what's this? Even leaks contribute. I love this. Higher flow. You know, if I have more leaks, more flow has to flow through the pipe to meet my need. That increases the velocity. And the higher the velocity, okay, velocity is just speed, right? We're not going to get too fancy. It's just more air rushing down that pipe to get to the end use. The more air that flows through that pipe, the more friction it has. And friction is pressure drop. Again, not to get too fancy, but you can just imagine it. It's just like water running down a through your pipe in your in your house, if you have too small a pipe, the more flow, the less pressure you have down at the end. Okay, here's an opportunity. I know I have some artists out there. So what I'd like you to do is, if you would, is up here. Let's see, not the arrow, not Mr. T, not line, not square. Oh, highlighter. Okay, so here I can pick a highlighter. Hey, Eric, I'd just like to remind folks, for those of you that logged in late, that the tools that Eric's referring to are located up here underneath the Quick Start tab, yeah. and I've just highlighted them with underneath them with my red uh, marker. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'll take the ball back. And then, uh, so, yeah, so if you would, select your highlighter, select a color. Orange or black would be good, although I've been using yellow. Somebody might even use green. But you can see this picture here, and I'd like you to highlight or circle any components, anything in this picture that you find interesting or might have something to say about it. Looks like we might have a beaver and a duck down there in the lower left corner. Uh, looks like the beaver's winning. Oh, yeah, that's another day. Okay, so let's take a look here. Do you see anything? Okay, somebody circled a valve, it looks like. Looks like just a ball valve. Circled those things down there. Okay. Yeah. What are those blue things? Ah, yeah, okay. Dirty pipe. Yeah, you know, when you're in a wood products industry, well, you can see all kinds of dust. You know, when a compressor blows down, there's a muffler on the sump. And out of that muffler not only comes noise and air, but also a fine mist of oil can come out there. And that oil can coat things, and then you get dust, and it gets very, very dirty. And then I have to do my laundry when I come home. And there's a potentially electrical hazard down in the lower left, a plug. Okay. Yeah, right. That could be a hazard. You plug something in, it's mucked up with oil, and next thing you know, you're you're feeling it, and not in a good way. Okay. Somebody circled up here, a little up at the upper left here. Uh, let's see if I use my tools. I'm trying to be a good instructor here. Okay. Yeah, what's that thing? Exactly. Well, uh, first of all, let's start off with the important things here. Um, somebody circled. These things are filters. And remember before, um, and also a source of pressure drop, if I have one filter, then two is better. Maybe three is even best. So in this plant, they had a problem with the dirty air downstream. So they just thought, well, we'll put in more filters. Okay. Did that fix the problem? Well, maybe it cleaned the air up, but it also imposed an increase in pressure drop. So eventually they found they didn't have enough pressure downstream. So down here, not enough pressure. So somebody circled this valve. This valve, if you look at it carefully, it's cracked open to let some of the air down because there was too much pressure drop in the pipe. So this line right here is a bypass line. Okay, the line behind it is goes through the filters, but we just bypass the filters. So filters obviously uh, aren't cleaning the air when they're not being used, and so we've just kind of undermined ourselves. And also, evidently, the plant can get by with some dirty air because um, they bypass the filters and they're getting by. Probably the thing to do here would be to buy one adequately sized nice filter, and then the most important thing you can do with a filter is to maintain the darn thing. So that's what's wrong with that. Okay, with your highlighter, highlight what you may find interesting in this picture. 
Take a look at the drops coming from the ceiling. Okay. Somebody's highlighted. What's that thing? I think that that's a, a connection line. Yeah, there's some small pipe over there. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay, this is a common thing to do in warehouses. They'll have a network of pipe that runs on the ceiling. And then add, as they add production equipment, uh, they'll just pull drops from the ceiling. Okay. And in this case, it looks like they wanted to jump the gap between this pipe and this pipe. And as somebody highlighted, they did so with a little quarter-inch rubber hose. Okay, this, there's all kinds of problems with this. And the main thing is pressure drop. So they're trying to get the air from one area over to the other. I don't know which way the flow is going. But they're doing so little, that's ah, not a good color, let's put black, these little quick disconnects. Okay, for one thing, little disconnects can be a big pressure drop. They can also be sources of leaks. Okay, and the air just can't get from one end to the other. Production equipment says, hey, I need more pressure. Okay, and then compressor guy goes, well, okay, it's going to cost you a half percent for PSI, but fine, I'll give you more pressure. And so it's costing us, all because of this little short run of cheap hose that we put in as a quick fix. Quick fixes get put in, and they never get, re well, I shouldn't say never, but they can often rarely get reviewed and improved upon. It just becomes sort of a way of life. We also see drops here. Look at this right here. That's a good drop. Looks like maybe a quick disconnect and a rubber hose coming down. So all of these little end uses that need, or big end uses that need air, are all being fed by little rubber uh, hose that comes down from the ceiling, just not getting the air there. And it's costing us a half percent per PSI at the, at the service pump compressor. Okay. Yep, that's right. Get them out. Circle, highlight, anything you see interesting here. And uh, there's also some uninteresting things here, too. We like to provide a lot of entertainment. There we go. Got, oh, yeah. Somebody's highlighted those things. What are those? Yep, these multiple. <laughs> exactly. Area manager, I, I think, is what, uh, you know, do not take tools. <laughs> so they do things like put up signs that say don't take tools, you know, put them back. Kind of like my dad, you know, if ever took a tool out of his toolbox, didn't put it back. Well, bad things happened. So they do they do things like that, but but no one pays attention to the the big thing, and that is these guys right here. These are huge sources of pressure drops. Okay, it's certainly convenient. I mean, you know, at Christmas time, let's just plug all plug all the lights into one outlet. But you know, then when the house burns down, you wonder, well, maybe that wasn't a good idea, and that kind of thing happens. So we have all these hoses feeding things. Um, here's a foot pedal to operate this. Uh, you know, something looks like this might be a chop saw maybe, you know, something like that. Um, and then also all these little hoses that run around, um, you know, where are the hoses on the ground? What's on the ground? Well, people. There could be a horse with horseshoes. You know, if a horse walked by here and stepped on that, probably put a Put a nick in the line. Oh, forklifts. That's what I meant to say. Not horses. Forklifts. Forklifts drive over horses. No. Horses drive over. No. So anyway, the bottom line is here is don't leave your hoses lying on the ground because forklifts can drive over them. And then uh, then you have a problem. And over time, these guys get leaks. Now, if you need a convenient source of air power that's, that's uh, portable, uh, maybe at least you could put your rubber hose on a spool that comes from the ceiling. And that way it's not lying on the ground. So that's really the better way to do it, if you need portable air power. Okay, how many leaks do you have? Oh, I don't know. Feeling fairly leaky today. And if you don't know, that's perfectly fine. Um, leaks are always there. You always have leaks. So if you pick none, I challenge you. <laughs> but... Uh, Leaks in a plant also vary over time. Things start leaking, and then you fix them, and then they're back tomorrow. So 
what's typical in a compressed air uh, uh, components in a compressed air demand? Okay, if you take a look at this, this is kind of interesting. Now this is kind of typical. It's not necessarily your plant, okay? So, but this is typical, and I've seen it. Normal production might be 50% of it. So here you are paying about seven and a half times, you know, seven and a half a ratio, seven and a half times more to use compressed air than you are directly electric, but only half of it's going to actual normal production. So, I mean, this becomes really, really inefficient very, very quickly. You're feeding leaks. Boy, that's expensive to feed that leak. Non-ideal uses, what are those? Well, those are things that, well, I'm going to use compressed air to do this, like blow things around. Take a look at some options, you know, for non-ideal uses. Maybe there's a different way they could do it, but eh, I chose compressed air because compressed air is fun, it's clean, it's there, I just plug into it, you know. And uh, But, you know, it's expensive. And then here's this artificial demand business where we've increased the pressure of the system, it's leaking more, I'm using more air, simply because I've elevated the pressure. This is kind of neat. I really like this. Take a look at this. A sixteenth little hole could cost about seven hundred twenty-one dollars a year. Okay, and sixteenth holes are all over the place. If you have regulators in your plant, you have a little bleed hole, and that's how regulators operate. They function by maintaining a pressure differential across a, a diaphragm, and on one side of the diaphragm, you have to relieve the pressure so that it can move to maintain constant pressure downstream, which is what the point of a regulator is. But different regulators have different bleed holes, and an eighth inch hole can cost you, just look at this, it really escalates. And I guarantee if you walked around your plant, you wouldn't be hard pressed to come up with the equivalent of a quarter inch hole, it's costing you a lot of money. And then down here we have, you know, a hundred dollar leak, can't be felt or heard, certainly there, but I, I can't feel or hear it. Maybe soapy water would, would reveal it, or a special fancy leak detector, which can be bought. $500 can be felt but not heard. And finally, if you walk by and the shirt tail, your shirt tail is moving around, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an expensive leak. And $800 per year actually is a, is a fairly small leak, but you could certainly walk by in here and feel it. If you go up here, back up to this table, just remember that. Common leaks, okay? What's number one? That's that forklift that ran over the hose. Uh, worn cylinder packings, uh, glands, valves and regulators. Well, regulators leak. I mean, they just, you know, that, that's one of their functions. They have to, like I said. Pipe joints and flanges, okay? You have a gasket in between two flanges. They can eventually blow out, uh, you know, especially in like a wood products plant, a sawmill. The, the sawmill's life, when it's born, says, I'm going to try to beat myself up. Logs banging around. Well, everything moving and getting jolted like that eventually leads to leaks, you know, uh, especially in joints. Okay, what do we have right here? Okay, I'm going to do it myself here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and point out the obvious here. Um, we have right down there good old duct tape. Duct tape is to save all of everything, right? Duct tape, yeah. It fixes a lot, but right here, not only do I see a potential leak, uh, what could happen, because the leak's gonna find its way through the goo and the tape, it's gonna leak out, but that could be a safety hazard, especially if there's an aneurysm inside of here. Um, it could blow out, and this bad boy could become a missile. And I do see one positive thing about this, and that, that is the user has at least shut off the valve when they don't need it, so that's good. Um, but uh, yeah, that's just an example. Okay, right here, what do I see? I see good old fashioned radiator hose clamp right down here. Okay, just like those old hose clamps do on your car, they dig through the hose and eventually you have a leak. And uh, so it's not the best way. There's better crimp type connections that have rounded edges that can hold the hose to the nipple and not result in a leak. I don't know who that guy standing back there is. Somebody I met. Okay, what do we have here? This is one of the funnest things in the world to do. You take an air wand and you grab this guy, you open up the valve, 
and you walk around, and you blow stuff all over the place. I mean, just, I mean, what could what what could be more fun, right? The trouble is, is that not only do you use a lot of compressed air to do that, but you really just blow the stuff from one end of the plant to the other, and now it's over there. So now you go over there and you blow it. Well, now it's back over to where you started from. It just, it's just kind of a hurricane. A better way. Ah. A broom. Hey, so this guy, this young man was told he's kind of relaxing. This foreman comes up to him. This was me when I worked in a plywood mill. You know, the plywood mill, it's down. If you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. Grab a broom and push that stuff where you want it to go. Don't blow it all around. Much more efficient. This guy's paying for his hourly wage just by doing it and savings from compressed air. Believe me. Oh, gosh, are we here yet? We're at the ending. I'd like you to remember three things, the biggest three things. Well, four. One, come to uh, November 15th, right, because it'll be a fun-packed four-hour. Controls. A VFD, or variable speed, is really the best for part-load control. Not full load, but for part-load control. So controls. Pressure. The lower I can operate, the lower pressure I can operate my plant, I can save energy, about a half percent per PSI. Finally, demand. If I don't have to replace the compressed air in the system, then I don't have to spend money on the compressed air. So think about your demand. Realize that leaks cost money, and you saw that table. 12000 bucks for a quarter-inch leak. Wow. And that's real stuff. That's nothing I made up. I made up other things, but that's true. Okay, leaks can account for about 30% of the demand. Very, very practical, or very realistic, I should say. Next steps, find your compressors. <laughs> oh, wow, there you are. Okay, walk around your plant, find your compressors. See if you can determine the uh, type of compressor you have and what kind of controls you have. Uh, more on November 15th on controls. But um, see if you can do that and talk to your you know, compressor operator. Really, what you want to do is get people involved. I mean, this is stuff that, that it's kind of like you know, your utility room and your washer and dryer. Somebody's doing the laundry in the house and you don't really care. It's just sitting in the corner doing its job. You don't really think about it. Well, start thinking about it. Go find those compressors and think about how you use compressed air. Attend the seminar. And if you think you might find something or a project in mind, talk to your, your trusty old energy person in the ETO territory, energy trust. Uh, territory. Contact PGE and uh, and we can help you. And certainly I'll be available to help you on November 15th. See, when's election day? Is that the 7th or 8th? Okay, we don't want to compete with that. Okay, compressed air seminar, November 15th. We're going to talk about all these good things and my top 10 O&M tips. Operation and maintenance opportunities. Okay? And I'd tell you now, but then you wouldn't come. So you're going to have to come to find out what those are. Okay, next slide. And you can receive a free energy cons consultation by talking to, to uh, by talking to your PG representative. Got a couple contacts down there. We got Paula Conway, Don Maloney, depending on whether you're commercial or industrial. And that is all I have to say. My coffee's done. I have to use the restroom, and I'm going to hand this back over to Beth. Beth, here you go. Hey, thanks, Eric. And we want to remind all of you of some upcoming webinars that we have. I have put them here on the screen in front of you. Um, you can visit our website to find out more. Our next webinar is November the 8th um, on LEDs. And as um, Eric stated, on November the 15th, we have the Compressed Air Systems Seminar in Wilsonville. Before we proceed to the question and answer portion of our webinar, I'd like to remind everyone that you can still continue to submit questions to me through chat, and I'll ask them of Eric. Within a few days, we'll be sending you the follow-up email, a follow-up email, excuse me, with the recording of the session and the PDF of the materials. And at this moment, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the feedback survey, which should just have popped up in the lower right-hand portion of your screen. If you could take the time to answer those questions, we really appreciate your feedback, and they, they definitely help us to improve our future webinars. And now, I'm going to move ahead to the question and answer portion of the webinar. Eric. Well, the first question we have here is um, the, uh, the, the questioner has noted that they understand now the variable speed control is more efficient than inlet modulation. 
when their compressor is partly loaded. But they have a fairly new compressor which does not have a, a, a VFD on it. Can I install a drive on my compressor? Ah, yes. Proud user of compressed air. Fear no more. There is an option for you. You've spent all this money on this nice, shiny compressor. Uh, depending on the compressor manufacturer, the, you know, where you bought it, uh, you may be able to retrofit that, uh, that compressor at about $100 per, per horsepower. That's just kind of an average number. Um, you might be able to buy a drive, install it, and then uh, hook it up. Uh, you really have to contact the manufacturer and see that you can do that. You can slow compressors down to about 900 RPM. So if you have an 1800 RPM direct drive compressor, you can slow it down to about 50%. Uh, keep in mind that the motor that you've purchased is probably not an inter duty, uh, inverter duty motor, and so eventually you might have to replace the motor. It just might burn up because it's not happy with the drive. But, you know, you can save a lot. Um, that could be a possibility. So uh, I say go for it. Great. Thanks, Eric. And uh, next question. Uh, most of my plant only requires 80 PSIG, but I have one piece of equipment which requires 110. So the whole plant operates at 110. Is there a better way to do that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Sometimes in plants you've got a bad apple in the bunch, and that bad apple says, you know, screen, like a little kid said, "Hey, I need 100 psi." Well, um, you might be able to separate that end use and feed it with a very, very small compressor, especially if it's like a cylinder pressure application where you don't really need a lot of flow, but you just need pressure to hold something. Um, so there might be an option to separate that out, operate by a separate um, separate air compressor. Another opportunity option might be to buy what's called a pressure amplifier. And uh, they're devices that you put in line and actually take compressed air and can, it's like a little little engine um, that takes, takes 80 pound air and can generate 100 PSI air at the other end. And you might think that um, that's magical. It's actually not, we can talk about that more on the 15th. But that's really an option. Um, I really encourage you to do that because let's see, that's 20, uh, that's 10% energy savings. So very good. Anything more? Yeah, thanks, Eric. We do have one more question. People can still submit questions to the host, me, through chat. Um, but our last question here that I have is um, our, our plant manufactures parts which require cooling. Liquid cooling is not acceptable, so we employ compressed air, which blows through uh, quarter-inch copper tubing with crimped ends. And the person is asking, is there a better alternative to that? Wow, these are great, very new questions. Um, I love inspiring questions that are creative from all of you. And this one, indeed, is a good one. Uh, compressed air is expensive, and when you blow it through a copper tube that's been crimped, there's all kinds of problems with that. One, you're using compressed air, which is expensive. Another thing is that crimped ends actually are very inefficient of the, in and of themselves. The air that comes out of a crimped end doesn't necessarily go to the part that you want it to. It sort of sprays out in different directions. So not only are you using compressed air, but the compressed air that goes through that, that uh, crimped end isn't going to do what you need. Um, cooling in general uh, just requires mass to flow through. I mean, you know, when you're outside and you're sweating, all you care about is a little breeze that blows by to, uh, to cool you down. You don't really need the pressure. You just need flow. So a blower might be a great application for this. As it was stated, liquid is not acceptable. But a blower that can operate at much lower pressure, much, much more efficient. So excellent. I'd like to see you do that. Well, thanks, Eric. That was our last question. I'd like to thank Eric, and I'd like to thank all of you uh, for joining us today. If you can take a few moments to finish up that polling survey, that would be great. And again, we do appreciate your feedback. We use it to improve future webinars. We're going to stay online for a while just in case you'd like to ask us any additional questions. And uh, thank you again. We hope to see you on the 15th.